Hello, this is Richard from Animate.com and in this video we're modeling a torch. We will use projection mapping to shade the surface as if we would shade textures inside the volume. We will use some vector math with the incoming vector and object coordinates and to ensure that we may operate both of them together we need to assure that they share the same vector space. We will transform the incoming vector into object space for that. So first let's make the, the basic shapes for our torch. We need some stick, some wooden stick. I added a cylinder and scaled it into proportions. And as I adjust the position and rotate it slightly so that it penetrates uh, the box. This cube will be our volume. We want to have a small flame right there as if it would be a match, a very small flame. So let's add a shader for this cube. Of course we will need our texture coordinates node and this time also the geometry node because we want to use the incoming vector. We will do some vector math, let's look at a sketch. So if we want to shade something inside the volume of our mesh then uh, we have the following options. You know there is a surface point on our surface and it has object coordinates which go there and also we have the incoming vector which is pointing towards the camera and let's call it vector i this is in global space so if we want to make operations with these two then we need to assure that this gets transformed into local space into the object space first but as we did that we can now try to get the corresponding position inside the volume at which we would look if we would look at that point. So our view would penetrate the volume and land somewhere inside the volume about here, which would be, this would be the location on the plane that intersects the origin of the mesh. O star is just the flat vector on that projection plane, which we use inside the volume. So O star equals our surface position in front and from that we subtract this component which we will get because it's, it's exactly, you know, this is also a viewing vector. It's exactly the direction of our view. So we take something along the direction of the incoming vector but how long should that be? Which is just the dot product between the incoming vector and the object vector. And I make a dot in between them to indicate that it's a dot product. So if we know these operations and take the difference between them, we subtract these, then we have coordinates for flat textures that will look like they're sitting inside the volume. So I add a vector math node and in order to add or subtract these vectors or to do any calculations with them, let's assure that they share the same vector space by transforming the incoming vector into object space. Right away, we can plug the results into a vector math node and I'm choosing to use project on this first vector math node. The second one will use the subtraction and we have the operation for the flat texture coordinates. We can test them by adding a gradient texture, plug in our coordinates and plug the spherical gradient as alpha into our shader. Of course we need to set the transparency settings, so in the material tab under settings choose alpha hashed for blend mode and switch off the shading. Our flame should not cast any shadows, so we switch that to none. Whatever our viewing angle is, we always see the sphere sitting inside um, the cube and sitting right at the origin. That's because we projected our texture coordinates centered around the origin of the object. We can adjust the position of that sphere by just moving the mesh. If we want to squeeze it and stretch it along one axis, then we need to assure that we have to do 
coordinate transformations, like uh, as we've seen in the previous videos, but this time we have to do it with both vectors, with the object space vector coming from the texture coordinates node and with the incoming vector after it's been transformed into object space. So we squeeze both vectors or the spaces of both vectors, of the incoming vector and of the object vector. And of course we want to do that because the flame shall be squeezed along the z-axis. So what can we do right away? We can also use the object coordinates to get a gradient along the z-axis. We will mix this vertical gradient with the spherical gradient in order to get some more complex shape of our flame. For this I'm going to use a map range node so that I can set factors along the z-axis and I will add a converter math node and set its type to power. Our base will be the gradient and the exponent will be the map range value. If we use the alpha channel of our color ramps colors, then we see some sharp edges. We can avoid that if we multiply the spherical gradient over that before we use this value as alpha channel for our shader. Okay, so this looks very spherical. And how do we get it into a flame shape? How do we stretch it along the z-axis? In our case, we have the object coordinates output from our texture coordinates node and the incoming vector from our geometry node that we transformed into object coordinates. We need to stretch both of them. So I'm adding a converter vector math node, set it to multiply and set a stretch factor. The X and Y should stay at 1 while the Z factor should be something below 1 in order to stretch our textures. If we want to do stretching uh, and if we do that on texture coordinates then we should assure that all vectors in the vector space that is stretched um, will be stretched equally. And now we are ready to distort our flame. Of course we want it to wiggle around like wind is blowing into it and we want to see some motion, especially the wiggling should go up as the heat will rise and lift uh, the air surrounding the flame. As you remember we already made fire and we distorted the texture coordinates by means of a noise texture. For that I want to subtract 0.5 from all color channels of our noise texture. This makes as much negative distortion as positive distortion. So each uh, RGB channel has as many negative values as positive values. It's an even distribution around zero. After that we can amplify our distortion by adding a vector math node set to scale. This scale factor will determine how much distortion we want to have. And finally, if we want to stretch our distorting clouds along an axis, for example the z-axis, then we can still add a vector math node set to multiply and set the scales of each axis on its own. Okay, I think that's the best output we get from the noise node. So now we need a vector math node set to add and actually we need two of them in order to add them to both to the object coordinate vector as well as to the incoming vector. And we can already see some distortion. Of course it's far too small. We will uh, decrease the scale of the noise texture. And that's the scale set in the node, in the noise node, not the scale for vector scaling, which is amplifying our distortion. This is the size of our clouds and if we want to have more distortion then I would select the scale node. Let's just group these nodes in a frame and call it distorting noise and let's give it some variation along the z-axis. We want less distortion in the lower levels of the flame and the higher we get along the z-axis we want more distortion. Since the flame is coming out of the stick, 
it won't move much away from the stick but the tip of our flame will be moving quite a lot. We adjust the values of our map range node and if we add a converter vector map node then we can do what we did in the third video where we animated the fire. We can offset the textures along the z-axis. For this I'm inserting two keyframes with two values on the timeline. I point my mouse on the timeline between the keyframes. I select all of them by hitting A on the, on the keyboard and I set the interpolation by hitting T on the keyboard and set it to linear. I will also ensure that the extrapolation is set to linear by hitting Shift E and select the linear extrapolation. This ensures that the noise will keep going up. I will add some more variation along the set axis for the color ramp and the transparency. So I think the transparencies look good now. Let's try to make a big torch instead of a small match flame. I will increase the distortion for that. I do so by amplifying the noise as well as adjusting the noise parameters themselves. And after some further fine-tuning and modeling out the match itself, we end up with a quite nice result for an endless burning flame. I made a lot of shaders based on this technique, uh, which I sell on Blender Market. Deep grass is one of these, uh, where we cascade a lot of grass textures to fill a meadow and have a rich motion, parallax motion, as the camera is moving over the landscape. Another example is the Deep Tree collection. Uh, it's a bunch of low poly trees um, uh, arranged in some libraries for conifers, leaf trees, palm trees, and with these you can scatter millions of trees uh, over your landscape. So you can cover mountains and, and mountain landscapes with that. Since we don't do ray marching for this, the render times are really fast. And last but not least, of course, the heat engine shader. It really seizes the opportunity to be on the surface as ray marching and refraction of heat distortion. In Cycles and EV that doesn't work. So as we stick onto the surface, we're still able to do refraction also. So I hope you got some insight on what projection mapping is and what it can do. Think about the possibilities of how complex your shading can get if you use volumetric projections rather than just sticking onto the surface. In the next video I will try to do some uh, coordinate transformations for tornadoes like twirls and bending coordinates. I hope you're looking forward to the next video because I am. Happy blending. Bye.